But during the mid-1950s, statistical evidence began to emerge from doctors and medical scientists that there may be something in tobacco that in some cases might be damaging to people's health. The industry immediately responded in a positive fashion. And in Southampton, British American Tobacco set up a laboratory to undertake detailed chemical and physical research into the nature of tobacco and cigarette smoke. In those early days, the chief scientist was Dr. Geoffrey Felton, now group research advisor. You must remember at that time, there was absolutely nothing known about tobacco smoke, and so we were starting from scratch. We had to make all the running and make our own mistakes. And there is an immense amount of research which has been carried out at this place in connection with tobacco smoke, which is now part of the general scientific information. One of the ways in which you can characterize cigarette smoke is in terms of what has become loosely known as tar. There's a confusion about what tar is in many people's minds. In fact, tar is smoke. It's the millions of little droplets condensed and collected to form what is commonly called tar. Now, this is a, a sort of umbrella term which describes the particulate material in smoke. In fact, everything in smoke that is not gaseous. This can be collected using suitable filters and can be weighed and then the materials present in it can be analyzed. One difficulty, of course, is that we were unable to decide for ourselves what materials, if any, in smoke should be removed or reduced. Up to now, nobody has come forward and said that such and such a component should be eliminated from smoke. But we do have ways in which a number of these materials, should they be singled out, that these can be reduced. And so we've had, for some years now, uh, a research project which is concerned with the way in which people smoke cigarettes. Working on human smoking behavior longer than um, any other research establishment and this means that we have now a very good database so that we can judge any of the results we get in comparison with results from medical research units and universities around the country. We start with a volunteer coming in to smoke a cigarette in our special smoking lounge and they smoke it through a small holder so that we can make our necessary measurements. Okay, it's ready for the top bag. Uh, turn towards you when that one's full. Before and after the cigarette's been smoked, we collect a sample of the person's breath, and this will tell us about the way the smoke's been inhaled. And this is taken away so that we can analyse it. We take the information that we've recorded in the form of a paper tape to the duplicator where we mechanically reproduce the way the person smoked the cigarette. The 1971 report of the Royal College of Physicians, which made the point that, and if I can just quote from it, since there is evidence that cigarettes with a lower content of nicotine and tar may be less dangerous, the amounts of these in all marketed brands should be published. And we were able, because we'd already established by standard methods, we were able to assist the government chemist in determining levels of tar and nicotine in all the United Kingdom brands. And what is most interesting is that this recent paper in Health Trends, the magazine of the Department of Health and Social Services, which deals with the changes in the tar, nicotine and carbon monoxide yields of cigarettes on the UK market, demonstrates quite clearly that all three of these components have fallen steadily over the last 10 years or so. And all this is the result of our research program for the last 25 years, which is continuing into the future. More and more has to be found out about smoke. The quality of the air we breathe inside has caused some governments to examine the effects of tobacco smoke. The problem as they see it is environmental tobacco smoke, ETS. This is BAT's reply.
past year or two, the people who want to eliminate smoking have shifted their line of attack. They are now claiming that we can all be at risk from other people's tobacco smoke. As a result, in some parts of the world, government have made it against the law for anyone to smoke in public places, and others seem set to follow suit. The arguments that they use on environmental tobacco smoke, or ETS, are often questionable, and the scientific facts they produce are not facts at all, but opinions. We in BAT have naturally taken the matter seriously. This is because environmental issues, such as reforestation, have always been very high on BAT's list of priorities, and also because, of course, we have to seriously consider all claims that are made about our products. Scientists in the BAT Research Department have done a great deal of work on environmental tobacco smoke. Details of that work and our findings are in this video program. The first thing you discover when examining the air that we breathe is that nowhere is it absolutely pure. On the top of a mountain, maybe, but in some parts of the world, I even have my doubts about that. All of these studies of indoor environments show that a person's exposure to ETS chemicals is likely to be extremely low. Yet in spite of this evidence, several government and advisory bodies around the world have produced reports claiming that ETS is a significant health risk. The evidence that these people rely on is based on a branch of medical science called epidemiology. Epidemiologists study the occurrence of diseases in large populations and then try to draw conclusions about what caused these diseases. Obviously this is very difficult because people are exposed to so many potential risk factors that it is rarely possible to be sure what caused a disease. In studies of ETS, the epidemiologists looked at non-smokers and compared those who were married to smokers with those who were not. Some studies claim that the women married to smokers had an increased chance of lung cancer. Based on an analysis in which results from all studies were combined, one authority in the UK, the Independent Scientific Committee on Smoking and Health, explained their estimation of the risk in the following terms. If 10 non-smokers out of 100,000 per year die of lung cancer, exposure to ETS would be estimated to increase the number to 11 or 12 or 13 in 100,000. This would be a very small increase, which is extremely difficult, if not impossible, for epidemiologists to measure in practice. Many scientists have looked at these issues. Some say that it's implausible that there could be an increase in risk at all. Others say that if there is an increase, it's so small that it's unmeasurable. One such doubting scientist is Dr. Francis Rowe. He's examined all the claimed evidence against DTS for years and comes to these conclusions. If scientists claim that they have evidence that say, uh, instead of uh, 10 in 100,000 people uh, die of lung cancer, there may be 11 or 12 or 13 in 100,000, they're being unscientific. Now, the air that we breathe, uh, as everybody knows, contains thousands of substances, many of which are potentially toxic, and some of which are potentially carcinogenic. Now, against this complex background, there have been claims are at higher risk of developing lung cancer than non-smoking women married to non-smokers. Of 23 epidemiological studies which investigate this possibility, the United States Surgeon General and the United States National Academy of Sciences rejected 10 as unsound. In only two of the remaining 13 studies uh, was there a statistically significant higher risk. Nevertheless, on this insubstantial basis, a lung cancer risk from exposure to other people's smoke has been claimed by anti-smoking pressure groups. On the basis of presently available information, it is my view that the risk of lung cancer from breathing other people's smoke is either nil or so close to nil that no epidemiological study, however big and however perfect in design, could possibly detect it.